empty buildings, ghost towns. They're scattered throughout the great American desert, reminders that this was once a harsh land. Only recently has modern technology offered safe and easy access to this beautiful but inhospitable place. But mysteries remain. Ancient living plants are being discovered, some of which may date back to the Ice Age. The amazing ability of animals to survive in an arid environment is only now being understood. But this delicate land is suddenly becoming something it never was. a playground for countless fun-loving Americans. A revolution in recreational vehicles has made it possible to penetrate the most remote corners of the desert. Almost overnight, the crowds have grown into the hundreds of thousands, but scientists fear that the desert is being changed irreversibly. And it's not only scientists who are concerned. The new recreationists in this once quiet land are finding their ways bitterly opposed. The battle has begun. Today it's uh, probably in the mid-60s. It's clear as a bell. The air is just as smooth and beautiful to breathe as you've ever want to believe. And with an off-road vehicle, you've got total freedom. Freedom to go into a, a, a land that uh, you haven't seen since uh, we came across here in covered wagons. You get to know each other, especially your kids. You know, you talk about a lot out here. And uh, it's fun. On days besides today, it's peaceful, you know, and because the air is clean and it's just invigorating. I just love it. The desert has changing colors. It's a super place, rocks, plants, and it's just a, a freedom that you don't get in the cities. Modern enthusiasm for the desert was not always shared by the early settlers. They struggled to build towns, but created no more than outposts of civilization. The only remaining inhabitants are the wild burrows. The frontier towns passed away, but the desert's quiet beauty remained. The rugged land took on a friendlier aspect. By the turn of the century, artists like Maynard Dixon were discovering the desert's colors, lights, and shadows. Soon the fascination of this wild land was drawing people from the cities. Along with tourism came the quest for health. It would be years before technology enabled people to put their homes on wheels and go to the desert in total freedom. The desert vehicle revolution began around 1968. It was then the Japanese manufacturers began promoting lightweight motorcycles designed to operate off paved roads. Combine these dirt bikes with a growing population searching for leisure activities and you have the ingredients for a new sport and a new culture, the off-roaders. It's like nothing can be described in words. It's like a total freedom. It's like your soul has suddenly uh, been born free and you've got the desert and the land and it's you and, and it's just great. The blurred landscape of the off-roader had an almost mystical quality. Dirt bikes became every man's flying carpet to the space age world of speed. You have a good feeling whether you're doing a wheelie or sliding broadside or going 100 miles an hour or going five miles an hour making it up that rock or over that log. It just makes you feel good, like running down 10 yards, cutting right, and catching the pass right in the right place. Makes you feel good. Motorcycling makes you feel good. Sagebrush horizons seem more appealing at 30 miles per hour. 
But underneath it all was a sense that riding in the dirt was a way to keep sane. It's, uh, it's my release anyway. It's what I do for getting away and getting my frustrations out, I guess. Put your helmet on. Off-roaders make considerable investments in gear. Outfits are keyed to colors representing various motorcycle manufacturers. Specially designed knobby tires grip the desert soils. The bikes have always been noisy and easily offended non-mechanized desert recreationists. It wasn't long before the complaints started filtering in. The organization handling complaints and responsible for desert management is a federal agency, the Bureau of Land Management. The Bureau, usually referred to as the BLM, has jurisdiction over much of the American desert. For years, the BLM had quietly managed millions of acres of public lands, dealing mostly with ranchers and miners. But the area it controlled possessed great potential for recreation. And in the 1960s, the BLM suddenly realized that the desert's scenic resources were in high demand. Acting on a congressional directive, the Bureau began formulating a massive land use plan for the desert's future. Robert Badaracco, was recreation specialist on the BLM desert planning staff. The growing number of complaints about noise and dust from off-road vehicles disturbed him. Those who come out to the desert to enjoy the peculiar serenity and quiet and the sense of space in the desert are uh, just totally intolerant of the user who comes out primarily to uh, test his skill on a vehicle and uh, challenge the desert terrain with a, uh, a very powerful machine. The debate again hinges uh, around this problem of a basic and inherent conflict between mechanized and non-mechanized recreation activities. The two are uh, entirely un incompatible. Uh, as a planner, I have to uh, deal with the problem of providing for the needs of both of these groups somehow. And uh, it means making some very, uh, hopefully, some judicious uh, decisions about how to, in effect, zone these different kinds of users so that uh, each of them can have their opportunity, but so that the majority of people are not uh, uh, having to suffer a diminished recreation experience because of the presence of off-roaders who are creating dust and noise and uh, who psychologically uh, offend uh, the non-mechanized user. The initial reaction of off-roaders to complaints about their activities was one of surprise. They were convinced they did no harm to the environment. I don't see, you know, what motorcycles are going to hurt here. You know, there's just bushes and dirt, and uh, we make a ex few extra tracks through here. It doesn't mean anything. An off-road enthusiast who added indignation to surprise was California State Assemblyman Robert Hayes. It's, it's public land. It belongs to the American people. And it should be the, for the right of all people to use and enjoy. Uh, I don't see anyone out here that would be a bit unhappy if someone decided to hike across this land. The desert is one of the most viable, beautiful, hardy environments in the face of the earth. It stands cold and heat, wind and rain, uh, hikers and motorcycles. It, it accepts them and accepts them well. On the western edge of California's Mojave Desert, some scientists were beginning to dispute the assertion that the desert is a tough and resilient environment. Dr. Howard Wilshire works for the United States Geological Survey. He and other scientists have conducted extensive research into the effects of off-road vehicle activity. With instruments like this penetrometer, the characteristics of desert soils can be measured. Studies in the early 1970s began to reveal the ways in which off-road vehicles cause erosion. The soil uh, is the very basis for the living system here, the total biological system. And it is, uh, by nature's way, structured in a very delicate way so that the upper parts of the soil are the more fertile parts, they're, they're softer, 
and easier for things to move around in, both uh, microorganisms and, and plants. And that soil structure is, is immediately disturbed by even a single vehicle crossing it. But the important difference between vehicle use and all other forms of recreation is the rate at which the land is degraded. And it's far, far more rapid with vehicles than any other form of recreation. Some places are totally bare now. And the soil beneath the, uh, or where the plants used to be, is now compacted, so it's quite strong and hard. So that now we've created the conditions in these uh, canyon areas in which a rain that before would be absorbed by the land now runs off and forms floods. Water erosion also carries off fine soil particles churned up by vehicles. These bits of soil contribute to hazardous dust storms. The erosion is clearly visible. We can see the, that the land degrades very rapidly under this use. We now have a great many people doing it and it poses a very significant threat to our public lands. The warnings of soil scientists went unheeded. By 1972, off-road recreation was gaining full momentum. Most people used their machines for trips and family outings. But for a highly visible minority, sport was primary. Vehicles of every description took to the desert sands. A strong sense of group identity developed among off-roaders. Clubs were organized like the Las Vegas Sand Gamblers. Members were aware that their sport was on the line. We don't do any damage here. There's, there's no flora and fauna to damage on the dunes themselves. And we take a great deal of care about it. Every time we go out, if there's litter left on the dunes, we clean it up. We take, we take home more garbage than we bring, as we always say. Never before had masses of people invested so much money in four-wheel play. At the same time, desert research was advancing rapidly. Scientists were making amazing discoveries which would have sobering implications for the off-road movement. The focus of a great deal of scientific activity was a common desert shrub called the creosote bush. This shrub has long been regarded by the Indians of the desert as a miracle plant. Its medicinal uses range from treating sore throats to fighting cancer. The abundance of the plant is incredible. In the American Southwest, creosote bushes dot the desert landscape for thousands of square miles. But it was not the medicinal properties of the plants as much as their age that fascinated researchers. Measurements taken by a University of California botanical team led by Frank Vasek and Hiram Johnson showed that some creosote bushes were old enough to be called living fossils. The team examined aerial photos from the 1940s that revealed the tendency of some of the bushes to grow in rings as large as 40 feet across. Imperceptible from the ground, the creosote rings consist of clones spreading out from an original plant once in the center. The growth of creosote rings was described by researcher Lionel Sternberg. The ring is generally placed on a mound of uh, 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 sand, finer sand than the surrounding territory. The surrounding territory is usually made up of pebbles. I imagine that at one time, uh, maybe thousands of years ago, you had uh, this one plant established itself uh, by a seed. And uh, gradually that plant uh, grew out. And uh, for some reason, the center uh, died and it never uh, regrew on the center. And the plant gradually spread out. As scientists studied these plants in the 1970s, the amazing conclusion emerged. The oldest creosote rings may date back almost 12,000 years to the end of the Ice Age. But these living fossils lead a threatened existence. I have uh, 
gone sampling here often and found one of uh, my oldest uh, creosote ring, which I estimate to be about 6,000 years old, uh, with Jeep tracks on top of it, and uh, that upset me quite a bit. Damage to these ancient plants was perhaps inevitable, since off-road activity was reaching immense proportions by the mid-1970s. As improved vehicle design made rough riding easier, off-roading took on an increasingly competitive nature. emotional outlet I've ever discovered in my life. In this uh, pressure cooker, boiler society we live in today, we need this type of relaxation. We need to get rid of the pressures. Some observers feared the off-roaders were transferring the noise and speed of the city to the desert. Just as a private citizen uh, observing the scene, the thing that disturbs me about it is uh, that it really constitutes a transfer of our urban alienation from nature to the land. We are now capable of going to even remote and hostile places on, on the land uh, and never set foot on it. We're in our, or on our machines constantly. While the off-road movement grew, scientists continued their work. They became increasingly concerned about the desert's irreplaceable resources. Archaeologist Carol Rector is a consultant for the Bureau of Land Management's surveys of Native American cultural landmarks. Her studies focused on one of the mysteries of the desert, ancient Indian rock engravings known as petroglyphs. No one claims to understand the full meaning of the petroglyphs. Even their age is uncertain. They may date back anywhere from 500 to 3,000 years. Researchers hope to utilize them in constructing a picture of ancient desert cultures. Rock art was bound to be affected by the sheer numbers of desert recreationists. In some cases, the rock art has been removed. In other cases, it has been painted over by spray paint. In some cases, people have made their own elements on top of older elements. And this is all very destructive. It destroys the beauty of the rock art, but also it, it makes it very difficult for scientists it's very important for us to know all of the elements that were there so that we can say that an element does exist or does not exist. Carefully recording the petroglyphs by tracing on clear plastic is the first step in deciphering their meaning. Archaeologists have discovered rock art in many parts of the world, but the American desert has one of the richest concentrations. They could be used uh, for fertility. They could be used by shaman for various ceremonies. They could be used as, um, as uh, rain rocks in, in order to uh, help make rain. It's been suggested that they're used as in the hunting ritual to help in the procurement of game. There are many things, in, and the most uh, frequent reference is that, that they were just made to pass the time. The creators of these mysterious designs have descendants who still live in the desert. Today's Native Americans, like the off-roaders, are appealing to the Bureau of Land Management for their rights to the desert. Their spiritual grounds are medicinal hot springs and plant collecting areas. The springs the Indians use for healing purposes are desired by industry for the development of geothermal power. The tribes have been struggling to save areas like this for several years. We go in there for the mud and to drink some of that water and for our paint 
and uh, that we use in our ceremonies and our healing purposes. And there's herbs right there near the water. In desert mountains, the Indians gather only enough food and medicinal plants to meet their needs. When we go out and gather anything, it's just for our use for at that time and not more. And we leave enough there. We leave things there for the little animals. If everybody used Mother Nature or whatever was put here by the Creator, everything would be as it is instead of trying to destroy it by taking too much. The Indians ask only to maintain their age-old balance with nature, but something foreign has invaded their land. Obstacles in the form of new power developments and military test sites stand before the desert's Native Americans. There are so many trespassing signs that we see that we uh, we're afraid to go into a lot of places. And uh, that isn't fair to us Indian people because this is our country. The Indians' quiet protest is difficult for the BLM to hear amid the noise and confusion of other desert battles. By the late 1970s, the off-road movement had reached a high point of activity and enthusiasm. There's something about it that really gets in your blood. It really does. I never thought I'd be out here sitting on a pile of sand watching little cars zip around, you know. Ruthie Carmel expressed the growing antagonism towards the Bureau of Land Management. I really think that they ought to leave us alone, you know. I think they ought to just leave us alone. If they want to make wilderness areas for people who want to hike 40 miles into the woods, that's great. But we, we do try to take care of the dunes ourselves, you know, and I don't think they should be harassing us like they do. But the off-roaders weren't to be left alone. Studies were showing that desert wildlife was in serious trouble. Due to man's activities, more and more species were being put on the threatened list. In areas where off-road use was heaviest, a 1977 study found that animal life had been reduced by half or more. Among the animals suffering losses was the kangaroo rat. Along with many other desert animals, his habit of living just beneath the soil made him particularly vulnerable to vehicles. These threatened animals concerned BLM biologist Christine Berry. Desert animals are well adapted to living in desert conditions. These animals can take care of themselves when the land is undisturbed, but when man enters the picture with livestock and with burrows and with off-road vehicles, then man also has to be concerned about leaving areas and managing the land in order to protect areas for these animals. Off-road vehicle use can destroy the soil cover, cause formation of gullies. It can destroy the annual vegetation, the wildflowers and the shrubs. It essentially destroys the food and cover used by the wild animals. Off-roaders were a world away from Christine Berry as they began mounting opposition to the BLM. The BLM had denied dirt bike riders a permit for their annual Barstow to Las Vegas trail ride over 150 miles. In defiance, these recreationists entered the 1980s with a series of protests. The BLM and the environmentalists had never been so unpopular. The Sierra Club's the biggest problem. They don't, they want everybody to get off the world. That's their problem, but you know, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> I'm sorry, this world was created and people are here and we're gonna use it. And it's gonna have to be that way. And that's what this ride's about, it's a protest. A sagebrush rebellion was in the making. State Assemblyman Robert Hayes launched a bitter attack on the BLM and disputed the value of its environmental research. We're protesting the entire uh, mismanagement of public lands by the Bureau of Land Mismanagement. And that's their new name, Land Mismanagement. They say there's a great, they can't have this trail ride because of the environmental impact out here. Environmental impact on a course that after 27,000 motorcycles have raced over. 
There's a little bit of credibility there that uh, leaves something to be desired. Despite the off-roader's criticism of the BLM and the scientists, a new era of sophisticated environmental research was underway. Scientists had developed a powerful new technology to assist them. Today, satellites send back images that can reveal massive changes in the desert. Plant life can be observed over hundreds of square miles, and dust storms, caused in part by man's activities, can be traced on a global scale. The total magnitude of man's impact on desert resources can now be studied. Scientists have raised the specter of inadvertent changes lasting for centuries. In this area here, we're talking about uh, rest times to required to restore the soil of, of at least 10,000 years. If we walk away today and leave it and don't do anything else to it, the research points up the permanence of, uh, of the effects on the land for the immediate pleasures of people now. Even with gas prices rising, off-roading remains extremely popular. Ultimately, it falls to the Bureau of Land Management and the public to determine the future of competing desert interests. To assist the BLM in formulating a plan, a nationwide opinion poll on the California desert was conducted. The results were clear-cut. The American public is uh, very concerned about the California desert, the most concerned about uh, protecting the scenic qualities, the wildlife, and the uh, historic and cultural values. Similarly, uh, we found in these surveys a very negative, a strong negative attitude toward uh, off-road vehicle use in the California desert. We were, uh, quite frankly, very surprised about the intensity of uh, public uh, interest and concern toward the California desert, particularly in our national audience. We recognize that the uh, desert is the last uh, wild frontier, and uh, it's going to mean even more to the public in the future, in the future generations, than it does now. 